Good morning and welcome um, to our event today organized by Law Enforcement Action Partnership on Women in Law Enforcement. It's a feminist issue. So my name is Joan Slater. I'm the Deputy Chief Executive Officer at Transform Drug Policy Foundation. We're an independent charity dedicated to making safer drug policies a reality. And for us, that means taking control of the market and legally controlling and regulating it. Um, I also run a campaign called Anyone's Child. This is an international network of families who tell their stories of how the impact, the impact of the drug war. We've had a war on drugs or the UN led uh, enforcement based approach to drugs now for over 70 years. What's clear is that it has failed, isn't working and has become a war on people. And the impact of this policy has been felt most by the most vulnerable and marginalized in our society. And this has race dimension, class dimension, a gender dimension. To the point that we now have a drug policy that is causing even more harm than the drugs themselves. So the panel today is gonna to look in particular at the impact of our drug policies on women through a law, law enforcement perspective. We're gonna make the case that drug policy is a feminist issue. We wanna demand that we end our drug, policy, our drug policies as they currently stand and we shift to a health-based approach centered in equity and social justice. And we wanna involve those most impacted in this discussion as we look to reformulate our drug policies. So with no further ado, I'd like to hand over to Suzanne Sharkey, the Deputy Director, Director at Law Enforcement Action Partnership. Good morning, I'm Suzanne Sharkey of LEAP UK, Law Enforcement Action Partnership. Um, so it's 2023, in the last month, a male friend said to me, women have equality, you're 50% of the population after all. And I laughed and he regretted the question, but it's not his fault, it's what he has seen and what he has learned and unaware of still how today we live in a gender biased society. I too was unaware of the enormity of the gender bias until I began my journey in recovery and activism in drug policy reform. So globally, 75% of unpaid work is done by women. We are the backbone of society that holds families and communities together and it is literally killing us. So I'll give you a few examples to set the scene. Women are 47% more likely to be seriously injured in car accidents, in the medical profession, women go undiagnosed for medical conditions far longer than men, and women are likely more likely to be prescribed sedatives or antidepressants rather than appropriate pain relief. AI that has been brought into the medical sphere now to assist, which would be an obvious benefit to everybody, which we assume is gender neutral, isn't. Because there's not the acknowledgement of massive gaps in medical data when it comes to women medical data being heavily skewed by the male body and could make diagnosis worse rather than better. Seeing men as a human default is still deeply embedded in the structure of the heart of human society. And there's a shocking life-threatening lack of sex desegregated data. So where's drug policy in all of this? Well, one of the most discriminating policies in the world is the drug policies, and it is especially for women. When drug treaties say we're working together for the health and welfare of humankind, it means men and drug policy disproportionately affects women and are entrenched in patriarchy and sexist ideologies. In my life so far, I've been sexually assaulted, discriminated against, bullied and treated less than the butt of sexist jokes or banter. And that was before I joined the police. When I joined the police, there were very few policewomen and I was young and naive and keen to prove my worth. I wanted to be accepted and approved to be part of the team, part of that institution. And in order to do that, I like this phrase, but I had to man up and do what I was told to shut up, get on with it. I was taught how to police my community by other policemen and adopted their ways of doing things. And this included targeting people from where they came from, what they were wearing, what they looked like, and I didn't just put on the uniform, I mentally armoured up. I was taught to toughen up and show vulnerability was a weakness. 
what I can see now clearly as an environment that bred toxic masculinity, and it's still evident in the services today. I'm not proud of this, but I couldn't speak out and I had to conform to fit in. And so I did what many women do in self-silence. I saw women who had spoken out and spoken out against what they saw, what they saw was wrong or unjust, and they were labeled awkward, difficult to work with, and so you avoided them. I remember being punished because I wasn't arresting enough people. My punishment was a week on foot patrol on my own on late shift. This type of policing created an unhealthy environment and created one of them and us, not only within the police, but in the communities we served. I didn't speak up when I should have. And I can clearly see now racism, sexism, misogyny, and the system of policing that divides communities. I can clearly see how, how we police drug laws compounds the problem. And I absolutely fulfilled that role who knew a place. Hindsight's a marvelous thing. And I wish I'd done things a lot differently. I wish I had used my voice. I wish I had stood up to work colleagues and had that self-belief I have today that my experience, my living experience and perspective matters. But I was brought up in a hugely sexist culture and my time in the police was reinforced this. And I'd like to think it's much better now. And on an individual basis, it is, but globally it's not, and it's not good enough. So what if we looked at the war on drugs isn't failing, actually? What if we looked at it as a well-oiled machine to support and maintain power, to sustain a system of patriarchy, support capitalist growth, social inequality, to keep society divided in their communities, to keep women in their place, and to punish those most vulnerable in our societies? It's actually an astounding success. So the systems in place aren't actually broken. They've been made that way by people in power for the privileged few at the cost of many, particularly women. All people who use drugs face extreme, extreme stigma and discrimination, but women are more often likely to be severely vilified, especially if they use problematically. The criminalization of people who use drugs has a disproportionate impact on women, particularly those who are poor, socially deprived, or belong to a racial or ethnic minorities, even more so, as I said earlier, if you use drugs problematically. And I've experienced this firsthand when I too was in the depths of addiction at the time. I didn't know what was wrong with me, but what I did know was that society judged me, stigmatized me, made me feel more ashamed. It told me I was a bad person, especially as a mother who couldn't stop using for my children. And it was the dominant ideology of patriarchy. It was that, it was what I was brought up to believe, that overarching view of what a woman's role is in society that kept me in the shadows. And it kept me in the illness longer, and it certainly stopped me asking for help. So who are we actually locking up and punishing? Men are always at the head of organized crime gangs and major drug operations, and yet the rate of imprisonment has, of women has far outpaced that of men. A global penal reform report shows women and girls in prison has increased by 50% since the turn of the century. And that isn't as a result of increased criminal activity, but harsher drug policies. Most women, I would say, shouldn't even be in prison and are victims of the illicit trade. They have been exploited because they are women and women are easily exploited. The prosecution of women rarely takes into account the reasons why their lived experience their living experience or perspective. That a woman who acts as a drug mule because she has been coerced by a partner or been kidnapped or raped, and if she refuses, threats made to family members and blackmailed, let alone the lack of mainstream livelihood or live in extreme poverty. Sexual offences occur in the drug trade go unreported. And whether that is in the supply of demand to the market, how would you, who would you report to and what would be done? especially if you're a woman who uses drugs, and again, even more so if you use problematically. Women are systematically sexually assaulted when acquiring drugs. One benefit of prohibition I see for women is the dark net, making it safer for women to obtain drugs and actually could be championed as a harm reduction, keeping women safer and reducing the opportunity for sexual assaults to occur. <clears throat> What I've learned is that policing and enforcement of drug laws is part of that oil well machine. 
It's part of the problem, not the solution. And if we continue to police with the aim of reducing supply and demand of drugs, all we will continue to see is more harms, more violence, more discrimination, more criminalised and people in prison, and women will pay the highest price. And again, you know the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. Drug law enforcement fits that perfectly. There's a paper on the impact of drug policy in women's states and recommends less punitive laws for minor and non-violent drug infractions are the best single means of reducing incarceration of women. I would actually go a step further and say, and the evidence shows, is to end the criminalization of all people who use drugs. And we need to call for a fully regulated market of all drugs, because this indeed would make the biggest impact. In order to create a sustainable change, we have to radically reform the system. And this can't be simply done by changing people leading it, rewriting the manual, or simply adding more women. If those women like me, to, to succeed, can only conform to the system. We just reproduce a larger workforce with the same harmful outcomes to the police service and to the communities they serve. Today, actually, I would make a much better police officer and that's down to the skills I learned in recovery. Those traits, as an active police officer, I have to crush to connect with individuals where they are at and not where I think with my moral judgments they should be. To be vulnerable and courageous, to be more compassionate, show empathy and understanding, to listen, to hear what has actually been said. To be patient, to be tolerant, to be more kind. So I'll finish by saying drug policy is a feminist issue. It's the driver of injustice, discrimination, stigmatization of many women, and reform needs women represented with all their lived and living experience. Space is created for affected women to talk, listen, and be heard, and for female lives and perspectives to be brought out of the shadows to the benefit of everyone. If women are involved in all processes, they won't get forgotten. Thank you. Thank you very much, Suzanne. And now we'll hear from Debbie King. Thank you, Jane. Good morning, everybody. I joined Leap UK in 2016, but this is the first time I've spoken publicly about my story, so please do bear with me. I speak today wearing two hats, that of a retired police detective inspector and that of a mother and a grandmother affected by the current drug policy in the UK. I'm unfortunately for me in a unique position, having seen our drugs laws from two very different perspectives. I shall try to cram 20 years into the next six minutes. When I joined the police, I formed the same views as every other police officer I knew, that the Misuse of Drugs Act was a really good piece of legislation and that drugs, drug misuse was a scourge on our communities that we needed to tackle by arresting and removing these people from society to keep us all safe. I learned that heroin especially can inevitably lead to crimes to fund its use. I want to say that I'm ashamed I ever held that viewpoint. Years after joining the police, I discovered my youngest daughter had been using cannabis and this had then led on to heroin addiction. I'd caught her using cannabis once and I warned her of the dangers of this leading to class A drugs and further problems. She just rolled her eyes at me as teenagers do and told me that I was being over dramatic. But of course this did lead to being a problematic heroin user. I wish I hadn't had to go through this lived experience in order to realize that we have it all wrong in the UK. All drug addiction is a health issue and should not and cannot be dealt with effectively through the criminal justice system. I kept my daughter's addiction secret at work for many years, not because I was ashamed of her, but because I was aware of the judgment and the stigma and I didn't want her judged. She was a good person with the kindest heart. I didn't want her to be labeled for the rest of her life. And I kept my desperation as a mother to myself. When my daughter was 21, she had a baby boy and never touched drugs throughout her pregnancy or his first year, 
In fact, she didn't even eat unhealthily during her pregnancy. She didn't even eat sugar as it was bad for the baby. She was a, she was a wonderful and model pregnant mother. A year after he was born though, I discovered she'd relapsed into heroin use again. And by the time my grandson was four, we had persuaded her to go into rehab. And after pushing the local authority, they agreed to fund her, but they wouldn't fund her son. She didn't want to leave her son, but she had no choice as there were no mother and child places available. I think this was the start of the biggest change in my daughter for the negative. She hadn't wanted to leave her son at all, but she knew that she had to do something to help herself so that she could be a good mother. So her son stayed with my parents, his great grandparents during the weekdays, and I visited every day after work, and I took him home with me every weekend. This was supposed to be a temporary measure for six months. However, she didn't make it through the rehab and she failed, return, failed to return home to us. I later discovered that after only three weeks in the rehab, they'd allowed her, accompanied by another girl who'd only been in the rehab for six weeks, to go out on their own into the local town. So what do you think happened? So by this time, I decided after two years of her failing to return, to move my grandson permanently to live with me. And of course, to tell work. Two years after this, after four years of waiting and hoping my daughter would recover and take him back to be with her again, I sought and was granted a special guardianship order for my grandson. I'd hoped that this process, which took a few months, would shape my daughter into action and recovery, but sadly it didn't. Although work at the time were understanding and very supportive, as my career progressed, I was promoted again to detective inspector. With this rank, the, depend, the, the demands upon my time and availability increased with, our, with out of hours senior detective responsibilities, including call out during the night. And when I was on the call out rota, my parents would help out but it became increasingly unfair on them. They were in their 70s and my then 10 year old grandson to be moved from my house to their house, depending what shift I was on. I was capable of further promotions and I knew this, but this would require residential courses to prepare me for more senior roles. Something I couldn't commit to with a 10 year old at home and nobody else to look after him for weeks on end. I felt torn between the career I loved and caring for my grandson. Then in 2018, my daughter had missed probation appointments and for this, she was sentenced to six weeks in prison. I feared for her especially as prison was no place for my daughter. I also couldn't go and visit her because I couldn't risk being recognized as a police officer and the impact this would have on my daughter in prison. So I could not go and see her. This was the final straw for me. Her addiction was impacting how I felt at work as well as in my personal life. I felt helpless and desperate for change to help my daughter and others like her. I started to feel as though I worked for the enemy and I was helpless to change things. And so I felt I had no choice but to retire five years early from the police and take up another full-time job. I believe my daughter's behavior and addiction became increasingly worse as she became increasingly guilt-ridden and ashamed that she wasn't raising her son as a mother should. These feelings are ever more powerful for women than they are for men. And of course, with no responsibilities, she had the freedom to sink further into addiction. I knew this could happen, but I, I was left with no alternative given her continued drugs misuse. And this still to this day causes conflict between us. She sees me as having stolen her son, rather than face the reality of me taking care of the most precious thing that she has. But I also know that this isn't her fault. 
This has impacted my life and my career and the lives of her family, her father, her sister, who were desperate to have her back. And sandwiched in the middle of all this, is my wonderful now 15 year old grandson who hopes to go to Sandhurst and become an army officer. I'd like you to consider why does an anorexic daughter get help, support and sympathy because she's compelled to do something that is harming herself. Yet my daughter, who is a problematic drug user, is not worthy of that response. It's because of the Misuse of Drugs Act. It's criminalised my daughter and that's the only difference. They're both suffering unresolved issues that they treat themselves, how they treat them and how they're feeling just manifests itself in two different ways. There was once a roundup of a large drug dealing gang in Derby whilst I was a serving police officer and the police announced its huge success all over the media. I asked my daughter about the impact and she replied, we struggled for about a day, but then normal service resumed. This isn't success, it's firefighting. And we've been doing it for over 50 years in the UK. Drugs are easier for our young people to get hold of than alcohol is. Prohibition does not work. As a mother, my daughter's feelings of guilt and shame are magnified. And as her mother, my opportunities have also been limited by the lack of proper treatment and help available for my daughter to enjoy living and be a mother again with proper help and support. I fear for my daughter's safety every day of my life. What kind of humane society throws its most vulnerable in society into the hands of serious organized criminals? We've turned our backs on them for too many years. Women especially are disproportionately harmed by our drug laws. I dream of a humane society in the UK that would regulate drugs and decriminalize them. It would help those struggling with addiction issues, remove the stigma and shame and provide a safe environment to gradually recover from drugs misuse. And recreational drug users would know exactly what they're getting and be educated on any dangers as we all are with alcohol. We'd have heroin assisted treatment centers where heroin users could have the daily chaos and panic removed from their lives and gradually with care and compassion start to rebuild their lives. We would steal the drug traffickers customers and keep them safe from further harm. County lines where children are recruited to deal drugs would reduce significantly with hardly anybody to deal drugs to. My only hope is that this happens in time to give us back our clever, funny, beautiful, kind daughter, sister and granddaughter and mother and the daughters and sons of thousands of other parents in the UK. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie, for sharing that very powerful and personal story. Um, and now I'll hand over to Julia Hentjes. Morning, everyone. My name is Julia Ryland, and I'm a former Metropolitan Police Officer. I worked as a neighbourhood officer in Camden Town, a well-known tourist location in inner city London, sometimes referred to by the tourists as the Amsterdam of London, but by police, a drugs hotspot. Now, it's important to acknowledge that my experiences are UK focused and drug laws and police procedure vary massively from country to country. But from talking to officers internationally, I know that many share the thoughts and experiences that I'm gonna to talk to you all about today. We as police officers have been fighting on the front line of the war on drugs for decades. And it's about time we started being honest about what that's like from a police perspective. I had to leave the police in order to speak out. Serving police officers cannot actively engage in politics, and unfortunately, this remains a political issue. I joined the police to protect the public and to make a positive difference, but I left the police because current UK drug policy was preventing me from doing so. 
prohibitionist international drug policies are preventing police policing from embedding evidence-based best practice into routine police procedure. So the rest of my time today, I'm gonna to talk about my experiences policing Camden Town as a female police officer and the personal conflict I experienced between policing priorities and evidence-based harm reduction. So as a neighborhood officer in Camden Town, my focus was proactive preventative activity. I had to get to know the community, understand the policing relevant issues and build a positive relationship between the community and the police. The community's main concerns were the visible drug dealing, the drug use and the drug related antisocial behavior. The main approach that I was encouraged to use by the police was stop and search. And if I found drugs, I would usually make an arrest and apply a criminal sanction. The only exception to this was for cannabis, where I was allowed to use an out of court disposal, basically a warning for a first time offense. However, after this first warning, many people caught with cannabis for a second time were arrested and given a criminal record. Yet through my personal research in this area, I knew stop and search and arrest and criminalization of possession can be incredibly damaging. The impact that a criminal conviction can have on somebody's life chances can be vastly more damaging than the harms caused by drug use. I also knew that police interventions very rarely dent the overall availability and supply of drugs. I also knew that most people who use drugs pro problematically are people who have, who have experienced and are coping with trauma. Even though I knew these things, I had incentives to stop and search and make arrests, which I'll come back to. The homeless community and street drug dealers, usually young cannabis dealers, occupied almost all of my time and that of my colleagues. The drug dealing was surprisingly visible with very little attempt to be covert. A rotating group of the same people standing outside the same shop pretty much 24 hours a day. And as a neighborhood police officer, I had to be seen to be addressing the presence of the dealers because that's what the community wanted to see. I chose to engage with them in a friendly, approachable, non-combative way. And I did the same with the homeless community. And I found over time that young dealers started to give me a nod and walk away from the area upon sight and without request. <clears throat> homeless substance misusers started to, to dispose of their drug paraphernalia more safely having listened and understood my justifications. Any initial hostility stemmed from fear and uncertainty about how I would discharge my powers. Once they trusted that my decision-making would be fair, reasonable and appropriate to circumstances, fear and hostility reduced and cooperation and compliance improved. It was a two-way relationship, making both my job and their lives easier. And this is why neighborhood policing works. But crucially, I had incentives to stop and search and make arrests for drug possession. As a neighborhood officer, the most, the most straightforward way in which my performance was assessed was the extent to which I had conducted legal stop and searches and the number of arrests that I had made. Arresting somebody for possession of drugs is a straightforward routine process that usually results in a charge and a positive impact on my performance measures. What this does ultimately is incentivize officers to reach for that low hanging fruit, drug possession arrests. For as long as police procedure encourages stop and search and arrest by measuring officer performance by these actions, police officers are not going to stop taking these actions. The interactions that I had as a neighborhood officer were personal, but when I enforced drug laws against the public, it undermined not only my relationship with them, but also their wider perception of authority and of trust in the police. When making a decision about whether to stop and search somebody, I had to balance the expectations of the job and the positive impact it could have on my own performance measures against the knowledge that it could cause harm and undermine the wider objectives of neighborhood policing, which was supposed to be my priority. I often felt uncomfortable that the discretion that I was nominally allowed could not be discharged in a way that aligned with my knowledge of evidence-based harm reduction. To be clear, if I found a young vulnerable woman who was homeless and in possession of class A drugs, the only option I had was arrest. 
This usually involved handcuffing them, putting them into the back of a police van and strip searching them upon arrival in custody. An utterly degrading experience. And then I'd see them back on the street a few days later. And to me, this just didn't make any sense. A time consuming and expensive investigation, case file and court hearing would follow. None of these provided any help or support to address the underlying causes of, the, of their problems. But it did use vast amounts of police time and resources that would be much better spent elsewhere. Prohibition prevents the prioritization of evidence-based drug-related harm reduction and criminalization causes harm to disadvantaged and vulnerable communities and stigmatizes drug use in a way that does not prioritize public health. As police officers, it's our job to protect the public, but drug law not only prevents us from doing so, it encourages the use of tactics that can contribute to the harm that people experience. We urgently need radical policy reform so that police officers can protect people from harm rather than contributing to it. Thank you very much, Julia. And now over to Diane Goldstein. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm very honored and humbled to be here. Um, this is my third UN starting at UNGAS. I'm a retired career police officer and currently the executive director of the Law Enforcement Action Partnership, a nonprofit group of police prosecutors, judges, and other criminal justice professionals who speak out and work to advance justice and public safety solutions. I'm going to link both my policing career and why women matter in policing, as well as just talk a little bit about drug policy. March is a special month for me. It's both uh, celebrates women and our role in, uh, globally, but I also immigrated into the United States on St. Patrick's Day, March 17th, 1966, as well as I got hired as a police officer on March 17th, 1983. But March also brings me much grief and is what brought me to my advocacy because my older brother, who in many aspects I helped raise, was criminalized because of his substance use disorder and his mental health issues and ultimately died on March 18th of 2007. It's why this work matters. Many of us who work in policy and reform and in this movement are driven by unacceptable experiences of our impacted loved ones. My brother's death was truly an inflection point changing the trajectory of my life. It led me to where I was then, a recently retired police officer, to my current role as the executive director. Benjamin Mays, an iconic minister and American civil rights leader stated, every man and woman is born into this world to do something unique and something distinctive. And if he or she does not do it, it will never be done. All of us here have a role in improving our communities and other people's lives. I wanna acknowledge the many women that could and should also be standing here with me and discuss that although women have served in leadership roles through our past, I believe our capabilities are still largely untapped, not just in policing, but in many other fields as well. I would also like to thank the many men in my professional life who mentored me at a time when women really were the outlier in policing even more. I would not be standing in front of you if my chief and others had not taken a chance on a 21 year old who in many aspects was simply just a diamond in the rough. But I also feel that the biggest roadblocks to women in leadership are not just placed on us by society, but at times by ourselves as well. Even today, I think about how I've earned the right to be standing in front of an esteemed group and at the United Nations, yet I likely like some of the women that I work with, and maybe others in the audience secretly have imposter syndrome and doubt my right to be addressing you. 
In my almost 22 years of policing, I learned many things, but the ones I always chuckle at is that cops both hate change and, a, and the status quo. This cognitive dissonance can and does impede needed innovation that's required for law enforcement to move its policing practices into the 21st century and specifically on the issue of drug policy. My organization is made up of over 300 current, former and retired criminal justice professionals in the United States, not counting our international presence, who all believe that the war on drugs is an abject failure. Law enforcement professionals across the world have recognized we can no longer rely on harmful interventions such as arrests as a means to address substance use health and the current overdose epidemic. Saving lives and reducing crime and disorder caused by underlying problematic drug use are not mutually exclusive. A response that can achieve both ends requires a paradigm shift towards evidence-based practices that closely link public health and policing strategies with their most important outcomes, which is saving lives and reducing the morbidity and mortality associated with substance use and the harms associated with behaviors that range from crime to mental illness and homelessness. In 1983, when I entered policing, the Redondo Beach Police Department um, in California at that time only employed five women officers. In 2004, when I retired, I was the third field training officer, the second sergeant, and the only woman to attain a command position in a department of 110. When I left, notably, we only had five women officers as well, the same as when I entered almost 22 years later. Since that time, though the number of women have increased there, there are still no women that have been promoted to my rank since I left almost 19 years ago. My career path through law enforcement and working both managing a, a narcotics unit, a gang unit, and then as a division commander provided so many frameworks that led me to my current policy work. It also helped me be a better parent and it formed my leadership capabilities and it gave me the strength to be able to stand and dissent at a time when most police officers would not admit that the war on drugs was a failure. As the second generation of the vanguard of women in patrol, my on-the-job training was navigated through an undefined roadmap. I became a trailblazer in some ways. My path to leadership was laden with lessons as I balanced being a strong female in a male-dominated culture. I spent my formative years feeling I needed to prove my abilities everyone here does. My standard was not mere proficiency, but excellence. Those early years exposed me to many things, good and bad. I've seen the best and the worst of people, as well as both extremes and my coworkers, which taught me to rise above the fray. And most importantly, it instilled in me the strength and determination to always redefine myself and evolve through life. Ironically, it was my years in policing that forged my character taught me leadership in so many ways. Leadership is accountability, ethics, consensus building, mentoring, decision-making, and the ability to bring out the best, not just in yourself, but most importantly in others. Ultimately, good leadership can transform a group and organization and even nations. Women have been doing this since the beginning of time. Nevertheless, we don't recognize the inherent leadership traits we have and the potential to improve our communities. Our leadership traits include compassion, creativity, intelligence, the ability to think both analytically and strategically. I'm happy to see the emergence and acknowledgement of so many powerful women, not just in policing, but here in the United Nations and in leadership across the world. In 2022, LEAP celebrated our 20th anniversary. We understand the impact of representation. When we're talking about programs that deeply impact our communities, we know all community stakeholders need and deserve to be heard. 
We also know that it's important for communities to have police departments serving them who actually represent the demographics of those in their community. LEAP partnered with the 30 by 30 initiative, a rapidly growing movement of forward thinking law enforcement agencies, not just in the United States, but who are now gaining ground internationally, who recognize the value of recruiting and promoting skilled and motivated women in policing. Departments who joined the 30 by 30 pledge set the goal of reaching 30% women in their departments by 2030. Women make policing stronger. LEAP and our partnership with 30 by 30 reflects that we believe our departments need to reflect the diversity of our community because making policing a more balanced field improves public health and safety. It builds community trust and enhances the integrity of the profession. LEAP and 30 by 30 shared an exhibit last year at the International Association of Chiefs of Police where we connected with chiefs and command staff from across the world, many of whom committed to that goal of mentoring and developing and hiring women. In order to change police culture, which is badly needed, we need to make policing a more diverse field. We need to change the way we recruit and hire, making those processes more equitable and open to applicants of color and more women. We need to create space for a more diverse pool of qualified, well-trained officers to get on the leadership track and move the profession forward, benefiting both departments and their communities. And we need to prioritize justice and policy reforms that strive to make our criminal legal system into a criminal justice system. The system needs to be more equitable, transparent and accountable that relies on evidence-based policy and results in making both policing and other communities safer and healthier. I believe that policing is more than a job. It is a privilege and an honor to serve others. Advancing women in policing is not simply a women's issue. We must not just reimagine what law enforcement does, but who the police actually are. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much to all our panelists. I think we have time for one or two quick questions, if there are any from the audience. Or online. Hi. It's not so much a question. It was actually, um, it was listening to Julia. I, I live near Camden and um, uh, a friend of mine who happens to be a work in drug law reform um, was actually uh, was arrested uh, in, in um, Camden buying some buying some weed, a friend of mine, and um, I don't know. It was, it was just in, it was just interesting hearing your your account because when this friend of mine was arrested, the, the policeman was basically just almost apologetic, just just had no <laughs> just had no enthusiasm for it. it literally, was apologizing, and actually said. Um, you know, how much did you pay for that? How much did you pay for that uh, bag of weed? And a friend of mine said, uh, 20 pounds. And he went, oh, dude, that's like a 10 pound bag. <laughs> it was actually, this guy was actually giving advice. On that. <laughs> but, and, he, and, it, and it was funny because I had this sort of, uh, he, this friend of mine rather, had this uh, uh, conversation with the policeman and was sort of saying, um, uh, don't, you know, don't you think this is all a bit futile? you know, because you, you arrest people, you have these crackdowns every now and then, and it just seems like, and, and, and the policeman was like, yeah, when we do it, all that happens is the dealing just moves to the next street over. We can clear this street really effectively, but all we do is displace it. And it, there was just this sort of, which I think you expressed really well, there was this disconnect between the knowledge of police on the ground that what they were doing was not just pointless, but often actively, harmful and the sort of target driven politically driven culture um which was uh you know under underpins it all so it was just very striking to hear your um your description of you know my hood my yeah. friend my friend's hood rather I, I think um 
I think this is the thing, almost all cops think the same, but can't really say that. And they have to answer to, you know, the, the senior officers, it's their job, they've got to meet the requirements of their job. The problem isn't necessarily the cops themselves. They don't want to be doing it either. The problem is the policies that dictate that the police have to be doing it. But I mean, it's sort of, which sort of brings me to my actual question, which was, which is sort of, you often hear that the police are told that we, we uh, you know, we enforce the law, we don't make the law. Um, and then you, you know, and then you often hear police saying we don't get involved in politics and blah, blah, blah. And it's kind of like, we, you, you are involved in politics because you are the expression of the politics. Um, and I think it's really, I think it's really important that serving police, and I know there are these police entities like the Police Federation, Police, uh, anyway, there's, var there's, there's various police unions and they do sort of get involved in politics. But do you think there's a, what are the mechanisms for police to actually feed into the political debate that aren't seen as sort of inappropriate? You know, like the, the we're, we're, do, do you know the, do you understand the question? Yeah, yeah. Before, I mean, the, before they've retired. It, it's I mean. a difficult one, isn't it? There's a, it's important that the, 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 the police, policing is a political issue, but policing should never be politicised. Otherwise, worst case scenario, we end up in a police state and, and nobody wants that. So what we need to be doing is almost what we're doing now. We need to be talking to the people that are able to be saying it. We need to be focusing on the objective evidence-based decisions. This isn't really political, what we're saying. This is objective evidence-based stuff. And that's not that shouldn't be controversial, that shouldn't be political. The police should be able to speak about what the evidence shows works. Let me address that from kind of the United States perspective because um, it, it's very interesting you bring up such good points, Steve, is what we hear in the United States in particular from law enforcement is the whole, it's a cliche. We don't make the law, we only enforce the law. And I, I find that hypocritical because law enforcement in the United States is very political through unions, police organizations, even like the International Association of Chiefs of Police. They have lobbyists, they go to Congress, they weigh in on bills. And what I always try to go back to um, legislators and staffers um, in the United States in particular and say, look, you have to understand is law enforcement doesn't need lobbyists. There is no politician that will deny a phone call from a police chief relative to, um, hey, what do you think about this proposed legislation? And that, that law enforcement should be less uh, political in the United States because outside of the military, we are the only organizations that are given the right to use state sanctioned violence up to and including killing people. And I think that's a big part of this whole issue of what brings me to drug policy is I look at the amount of both police officer deaths and the deaths in our community that are caused by, by the initial contact because someone smelled cannabis or that you know, in our goal to create a drug-free America, which is still in our congressional laws. And so um, you know, we need to give the cops, like these folks who are standing here, the ability to stand up publicly and dissent in a way that allows them to keep their jobs because good police officers should not be driven out of law enforcement agencies when they have this knowledge and the skill set to improve how we serve our communities. I don't know if that answers the question, but it's a really difficult question. Thank you, Diane. Um, I'm being asked to wrap up now. So um, I'd like to thank all the panelists for their contributions. Thank you for coming and for everyone who's joined us online. I think these talks have demonstrated the futility of our enforcement-based policy. We've heard very powerful stories from the women impacted and on the front line of this, both from a policing perspective and from their personal experience. We can and we must do better with our drug laws. And I would suggest that putting the people most impacted at the table as we devise these policies is a really sensible way forward. And thank you very much.